Today is the last Sunday of June, and it's also the last Sunday of the quarter, which means that this is the last Sunday of our class together. So I bid you a sad farewell in that sense, but uh, I also wanted to take just a moment at the beginning of the class to thank each of you who's been a participant over the last quarter, and we may have a few folks, um, I think Patrick is gone today, but uh, so we may have a few folks from his class I don't know. We're very glad to have you with us for today. Um, some of you have also uh, been here through First Peter, so hopefully um, this has been a good thing and that it's been a blessing to each of you. Um, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I suspect it's true. Um, so First and Second Peter, when you think about them in the greater scheme of the Bible, um, they come from what, what are called the general epistles. And largely speaking, I think those are less preached um, not that, that, that preachers don't take texts from books like Hebrews and 1 John and, and, and Peter and so forth, but I think probably in terms of going through those books, they may be a little bit less, um, less handled. So hopefully this has been an encouragement, a help, and a blessing. Um, there is hand, a handout for today also, so if you uh, forgot that or that would be helpful to you, the, uh, Nathan brought the lectern inside the door. They're right back there by the back. And uh, let's turn to the book of 2 Peter for a final time today, and we're going to turn to chapter 3, just as we did last week. For anybody that thought to pray this week uh, for me, I appreciate that so much. I, I, <laughs> you know, the closer it got to time, the, the more I realized I had four or five ideas juggling around in my mind, and I, I finally had to decide. And so what, what we have today is, is actually um, probably one of those ideas, but with some input from the others. And uh, I hope it'll be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Let's read verse 18, just the one verse. Then we'll have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing, and then we'll look at this lesson for today. So the concluding verse of 2 Peter in chapter 3, verse 18 says this, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your loving kindness. Thankful, too, Father, for your watch care through this past week. And um, as always, it seems like uh, we've been over a lot of ground and, and uh, many different things have come our way. And in each of these, Lord, you have given us a sustaining grace. And we also thank you, too, Lord, for sufficient health and strength to be here in the Lord's house today. And Beyond that, for the fact that you've laid it upon our heart is something very important for us to do, and uh, even to make an extra effort and be here for the uh, Sunday school hour, we're grateful for that too. And Lord, thank you for these letters that you, by your wisdom, gave and saw fit to include in your word that Peter wrote, and I pray, Father, we will take many of these lessons with us, and that many of them will come back to us in days to come as the Spirit brings them to mind, as particular verses that have stood out to us as we've studied or listened um, have been a blessing and provided guidance and help. And even, Lord, in the days to come as we, we go back and our Bible reading takes us to this place, um, that some of these thoughts will come back to us. As we know, as Peter mentions um, in the book here a couple of times, we're, we're great forgetters. And so um, we just pray for your aid and your help in this, that those things that over the years we have learned and known and tried to store up in our hearts and lives will be there for us in, in the day and time of need. And would you bless in this time now? Would you bless Brother Ron here over on our other side as he finishes up his quarter today and any of the other Sunday school teachers that are handling our teens, our children, those that are working in the nursery and other workers in the building today, we thank you for each one and for their service and what they do to make it possible for us to come in and comfortably sit down and enjoy a, a, a time like this. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and wonderful name. Amen. Well, you see that I've entitled the lesson today, But Grow. And I wanted to challenge you along these lines. I think if you think back, especially if you were here for First Peter, I'm going to take us back a little bit over that ground. Not a lot of time, but I wanted to point out that you can't get away from the fact that this idea of growth is a burden that Peter seems to have. So if you don't mind turning a couple pages, just go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, because I want to show you the context of this. It first comes up in the fact that as chapter number 1 concludes, Peter has uh, talked about the new birth. And so he says in 1 Peter 1.23, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, and he goes on. 
So he mentions the new birth. Try to keep that in mind because it'll be pertinent in just a moment when we move to 2 Peter. But then immediately upon the heels of the, or right, right going on, on the heels of this, into chapter 2, verse 2, so almost immediately, coming out of this thought of the new birth, he talks about this, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. And this is the first time really that Peter brings this up, but then it kind of becomes an ongoing burden that is developed as uh, we go through both of these letters. It's in the context when he first brings it up of the new birth, so we might make the statement that growth is really an essential byproduct of the new birth. Something's not right if we're not growing and we've been born again. Something's not right with a little baby if the little baby doesn't desire to nurse, it isn't hungry. Something's not right. And in our spiritual lives, something's not right if we don't have a desire to partake of the word and, and to put ourselves in, in, op, in opportunities for Christian growth because it just comes as a natural byproduct of the spiritual work that God has done in us. Now this is all very interesting so that when you come to 2 Peter chapter 1, further to develop this idea, He's not quite as explicit in his terminology, but it's abundantly plain he's talking about the same thing when he says in verse 3 of chapter 1, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence. Watch verse 4. By which he granted to us precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So when he has this phrase, having become partakers of the divine nature, he's not saying that we become God. He's, he's, in other terminology, is referring to this concept that we just talked about, the new birth. And so what follows immediately, I mean, even more closely than in the one we just looked at upon this, look at verse 5. For this very reason, again, the idea of the new birth, out of this flows... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and so on. And he gives these seven characteristics of a growing, flourishing faith. And if you recall, in our lesson on that particular section in this chapter, that's what I called it, growing your faith. And if we are doing that, then you get down to verse number eight and it says this, For if these things or these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective, which is actually the word idle, literally it's the word idle, or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So growth is a, is a, and then the culminating thing is in the text that I showed you this morning. We spent some time with it last week, but I want to throw it at you in a different light this morning. He says, but grow. And what did we see last week? We saw this as a key part of our defense against losing our own steadfastness that that's something that can really happen, and we don't want that to happen, and so we can't just simply be always on the defensive, we have to be on the offensive, and so he characterizes this, but grow. Back in verse 17, beware, that's where the ESV translates this, take care. As I said last week, that's a little bland for me, this is a kind of a a somewhat more potent word than that expression for us today. It's kind of be on a continual self-watch is the idea, guarding yourself. That's defensive. Guarding yourself is defensive. Offensive is but grow. So a thought occurs to me, and it's a way that the Lord laid on my heart to present some of these thoughts that have just been sort of going around in my heart and mind as I've gone through these epistles. And even this morning, I got up in early and I read 2 Peter again. And the Lord just developed even more thoughts in my mind. So this is typical. I never have enough time because I have too many thoughts. But We'll do what we can. Is there, are there definite indications for this same thing in his own life? In other words, Peter's exhorting his congregations. I mean, you could call it that. He's writing to these churches. He's writing to these people that he has ministry with, that he has knowledge of, and he says, but grow. And it, it's, a, it's a consistent burden in 1 Peter and in 2 Peter about growth. Do we see anything in his letters, and more particularly this morning, 2 Peter, that reveal to us that this is something that was really active in Peter's own life. It wasn't just something he preached to others. It was something he was really burdened about in his own life. Am I growing as a Christian? Or, to go back to that chapter 1, am I just sort of idle and unfruitful as a Christian? 
And I think that's a great challenge for us this morning because I can't imagine anybody sitting here. You've taken the trouble not only to come to church today, but you've taken the trouble to come to uh, Sunday school. I can't imagine anybody here really wants to be idle or unfruitful. That doesn't sound to me like a very good description when we stand before the Lord when, when we finally do. And, and he says, well, you know, you had all that time I gave you since you were saved. I gave you 40, 50, 60 years on the earth. What would you do with your faith? Uh, you know, I don't think that's a, a good position for us to be in. And don't take that to too far, but I mean, I think you understand the point that I'm making by this. So what I want to take to the time to do in the, in the lesson this morning is to point you to three areas that I think we can definitely identify. Is this a complete list? Certainly not. But these are the things that the Lord has laid on my heart with the time we have this morning. I hope we can get through them. The first one of these is huh, growing humility. Now, I, I actually told you about some of this before, and I've alluded to this, but I'm gonna, I, I think I'm going to add something to this today, because when I got to it before, I really didn't have the time. That's kind of inter, in, in, interesting. I'm sure a number of you have met the Pelchers. Dan was, came up to me, and they had been in the class. They're in the new members class now. But uh, Dan came up to me one Sunday, and he said, you know, you know, in a lot of your classes, you end up saying that, well, we'll have to move on. We don't quite have time for this this morning. He said, I, I got an idea for you what to do on that last Sunday when you're already done the letter. He said, just, just make a list of all those things you told us you didn't have time for and talk about them. Well, I wouldn't have time. And so we're doing a little part of that, and I'm going to add to it a little bit. But think, I want you to think, first of all, about Peter's position. Think about the person who's writing this letter. What type of position does he have, particularly when you think of him in relationship to the 12 apostles? Well, noteworthy would be a mild word to describe it, I think, but certainly an appropriate word. Why do I say that? Well, because he was the, the informal leader of the 12. I put it that way because I think that wording will be acceptable to everyone here. We're obviously not going to go as far as the Roman Catholics and say that he was the first pope. But I don't think you can really argue the fact that Peter really was the informal leader of the apostles. Um, one of the things you'll notice, and years ago I did a series on the 12 apostles, and one of the things that you'll, you'll notice is that Peter's name, there are four lists of the apostles, and, and it's actually some really interesting, you, you would think that these, these dry, dull things where you just have a list or something like that in the Bible, you would think, well, you know, it's just given to us to give information, but you would be surprised what you can glean out of just studying those lists, because there are certain things about the way those lists are put together. By the way, you don't have one in John, so you have it in Matthew, you have it in Mark, you have it in Luke, and you have it in Acts chapter 1, the list of the apostles. You will find without exception that in every case, Peter's name is first. And I don't think that's just random. I think that, that, that means something. Then, of course, I think we're all pretty familiar with Matthew chapter 16. Peter was the one who gave that great confession. And in that great confession, of course, is truth to the church. Peter articulated that. And there is more here that we'll make a third thought out of in a moment. But let's look at this. So Jesus says that they, they say, well, some say you're Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus puts the question back to them in a more pointed way. And he says, but who do you? Who you say I am? What do you think? What do you say about who I am? Peter is the one who replies, notice. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. That, that just simply means Simon, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, or shall have been bound, is more literally it, in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed, or shall have been loosed in heaven. Now I realize there's a lot of discussion about these verses, and I'm not going to try to settle all those questions for you today. But I will tell you something I don't think anybody here can argue with today. Jesus only said that to one of them. So it's rather interesting. He only said he gave the keys to the one person. And he only made this statement to Peter. And Peter is the one we have recorded as making this confession. So 
Uh, is the foundation Peter? Some say yes. That's, of course, the position of the Catholic Church. That doesn't particularly bother me if, if we take that position. Some don't like that and say, well, a better position is that really the foundation, the rock that, that, that Jesus is, is building the church on is what Peter articulated there. It's his teaching. I don't have a problem with that position either. You can be conservative and take either one of those positions, but that gets us off into the weeds. All I really want to make the point this morning is what I've already said. Peter was certainly noteworthy among the apostles. That's the second reason I've given you, and uh, huh, we need to go back, that's why. The third thing I've given you is, is then in the exercise of those keys. So what do keys do? Well, if you get here too early, you won't be able to get into the church. So you don't have a key, unless you have a key. But if you don't have a key, you're, you're in trouble. Or if you go out to your car and you lock the house, car's in the driveway, and you get to your car, uh, I don't have keys. Well, you can only get, not only get into the car, you may not be able to get back into the house unless you hit a key somewhere or, or have something on your phone that lets you into the house or whatever. But keys, keys allow, they're a symbol of authority because a th entrance is either, either granted or denied. And again, you can get off into the weeds talking about these, thing, these things, but when you look at the book of, of Acts, it's kind of inarguable that Peter is the one who exercises that authority. He's the one whom God places or invests with that privilege to exercise that authority, both for Jews and Gentiles, because you have him on the day of Pentecost, and that's Jews, and then you have him in the household of Cornelius in Acts 10, and that's Gentiles. So the whole point that some of you might already have your hackles up, I don't know, but don't do that. Because you're welcome to whatever position you want on these. I'm simply trying to establish the fact that Peter was a known commodity, and a very known commodity. Well, that being the case, um, you know, there's an awful temptation there when you occupy a position like that to kind of throw your weight around a little bit. To kind of have a, an idea that, of self-importance. And that's that's really a carnal thing, but yet it, it really is so common for us if we're operating in the, in the flesh. But yet in Peter's letters, what we note is a growing humility, not pride and not lordship. So let's look at some evidence of this. Going back to 1 Peter, this is one I paused on when we were talking about this in 1 Peter, but it is really interesting as he reaches out to the leadership of these churches. So he says in verse 1, so I exhort the elders... So he's, he's reaching out to the leadership of these churches. You would think that of all occasions, if he's going to reach out to the elders, you'd think of all occasions, this would be the time for him to point out his apostleship. He doesn't do that. Instead, what he says is, among you as a fellow elder, he just says, I'm an elder too. I, you know, I'm coming from where you're coming from. In fact, when you get down later, one of the exhortations that he gives to these people in leadership in the church is he says this, not, verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So to me, I notice this and I say to myself, you know, these are hallmarks or someone, of someone who is, instead of what people in the world exhibit when they get to this place in life, I want to point out another scripture to you. What does John say? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world. And he gives three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. What's the last one? The pride of life. And someone has pointed out that it's interesting to develop the idea that these things sort of denote. They're not exclusive. It's not meant that you only have the lust of the flesh when you're young. But they sort of denote seasons in life where maybe that temptation is stronger. And as you get older, so it's not like when you're young, you don't have the pride of life. But it certainly is, I think, a, a problem as you get down the road in life, especially if you want to consider yourself somebody. You want to think you've accomplished something, and you want to think, well, I know all this stuff now. Well, Peter doesn't act like that kind of a person. He calls himself a fellow elder. And then, look, here's what we find in 2 Peter chapter 1. So, again... It's a couple of years, three probably later, when he's writing 2 Peter over 1 Peter. And when he does this, it's almost like this has increased. This, this, these hallmarks of humility have, have actually increased because he says, Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant, 
He says all of those things before he ever refers to himself as an apostle. And why I think that this is of note is because if you go back to 1 Peter, and there's nothing wrong with 1 Peter, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Paul did it in many of his letters, but his opening verse in 1 Peter 1.1 is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. But three years later when he's writing to them, he says Simeon, or Simon Peter, a servant. And in those two things, I think we've got two more hallmarks of humility because before he ever says anything about his apostleship, which I think is important for him to say because he's going to start getting into the subject of these false teachers. And it's important for him to establish that. But before he ever gets into any of that, he refers to himself as Simon, which was his earlier or original name. He also calls himself a servant, which is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So those scriptures that I have there, let's have a look at them. When he first got that name, this is the occasion, John 1, 42. He brought him to Jesus. That's Andrew, his brother. You know, if you didn't ever do that, just throw (laughs) it, I can't help. If you didn't ever accomplish anything else in life, but you, you won somebody like Peter to Christ, that wouldn't be bad, would it? Anyway, he brought him to Jesus. He looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. This is Jesus talking. You shall be called Cephas, this means the same thing as Peter, and that's exactly how ESV uh, sees fit to render it. It just means a stone or a rock. But it's interesting. Okay, so this happened happened early when they they first met. And as I think we heard recently, maybe, maybe Pastor Andrew was preaching on this, This is an earlier occasion from when you find Jesus coming alongside the the shores of the Sea of Galilee, like in Mark 1, and they actually leave their nets and follow him. This is kind of the earliest occasion when he first meets them. And he says this almost in a prophetic sense to Peter at this point. But it's interesting, occasions in Peter's life where he got a little too big for his britches, which is the problem we're talking about. Jesus saw fit to remind him, you know what? I, I'm talking about what you can be by my, God's, by, by my grace. Don't ever forget what you were before I met you, or before you met me, Simon. So here's an occasion. This is the Thursday night of Passion Week. This is right on the threshold of, of the betrayal and everything else. And he says to him, look, at how, look what he calls him. He's the one who gave him the name Peter, but he calls him Simon two times. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. And then he goes on to say, but I've prayed for you, that your strength doesn't fail. When you're turned around, strengthen the brethren. Um, we have it again. This is a, another of those occasions. I'd say, boy, this is really one of them, because now this denial has taken place, and now the Lord's got to get him straightened around. This is after the resurrection. So... He says to him um, after breakfast, Simon, see that right away? Simon, son of John. Didn't call, him Pe- didn't call him Peter, Simon. It's almost like a reminder, okay, you know, when you depend on your own strength, when you don't look to me, when you get too full of yourself, here's what happens. And he does this three times, verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John. And I think that probably was mixed into the till of the things that happened here, which we're not going to take time to go into, that ultimately broke him on that occasion, and he got right with God after that that problem that had occurred. So for him to go back and utilize that, I think, is a hallmark of humility. It's, um, It's not being afraid to... I mean, it's not like acting, I didn't do those things. Acting like, you know, I, 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 don't, ever, I don't make mistakes. I, you know, it's like, no, I, you know, I'm just Simon... And anything I have done and anything I will do is only by God's grace. So um, I think that that, to me, and I wanted to add this. Okay, we won't take much time for this. But, you know, I may have said this before, but we have a similar thing happening in the life of Paul. So let's just look at something. Um, Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Now, what I'm going to do is show you a sequence of three verses. The significance of the statements and the sequence, the chronology, is what's important. All right? Because let's read verse 9, and I'll tell you what I'm meaning by this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. All right, just remember this. 1 Corinthians was written somewhere in the range of A.D. 54, 55. Okay? Now let's go to the next one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians was written around A.D. 60. So in the first statement, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. In the second statement, if you go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, look at this. To me who am, though I am the very least of all the saints. You see the change that's there? From the least of the apostles to the least of the saints. As time progresses, there's a, there are these growing hallmarks of humility. And then let's go to another one, um, 1 Timothy chapter 1. So on the last day of the class, I made you look up a few more verses. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Now here's your difference. This is probably written three years later than Ephesians, around 63 maybe. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, so this is the latest of the three statements. Now look what he says. This saying is trustworthy, chapter 1, verse 15, and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Look at that. From the least of the apostles to the least of the saints to the foremost of sinners. You grow in humility. You have to walk with God to do that, but if you do, this will be a, pro a byproduct of it. And as I close out this thought, I just say, he seems to have learned the lesson that Jesus was trying to, he didn't come by this naturally. Jesus was trying to teach this to the disciples in Mark chapter 10. I'm going to skip through the verses because of time, but you remember it was James and John who came to Jesus and said, we have this request. Jesus says, what is it you want? Verse 37, well, we don't want anything much. Just grant to us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Not much, just... <laughs> and you see how we are when we first start out? You see how we are when we're left to our own devices? Jesus said to them, you don't even know what you're asking. <laughs> that's, that's, that's something to take to heart and explain sometimes why the Lord, in his grace, overrules some of our prayers. But at any rate, so we go to the next part of it, and then Jesus says to them in verse 42, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, that's how they act. They lord it over them. They're great ones. They're known, that's how they're known for greatness. They exercise authority over them. But he says, it shall not be so among you, not among my disciples. That's not greatness. But whoever would become great among you must be your servant, is what he called himself, a servant and an apostle. Whoever would be first among you must be servant or slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto or to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is to be Christ-like. And it's there in Peter's life. All right, we have to hasten. Let's go to the next one. Growing in submission. So we're not moving very far. We're just going to the next verse. From 1 to 2. So he says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Jesus our Lord. And so here's the statement. You can look up, we'll look at most of these, but you can do more with this later. If you go through 2 Peter, in every unambiguous reference, and what I mean by unambiguous is, some references, it just refers to the Lord, and so it, it could be the Lord as in God in heaven, or it could be a reference to the Lord Jesus. But in every unambiguous reference where he makes it clear he's talking about Jesus, by including the word Jesus, he also calls him Lord. So the only possible exception to that is verse 1, where it ends by saying, with ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then that immediately is followed by the next verse, which I just read. Jesus, our Lord. That's a tone setter for the book. It really is, folks. This fact that he has 
put this down from the very beginning. There's, a, there's an extremely high Christology in 2 Peter. Not high in the sense that it's, un, it's um, exceptional in the New Testament, but it's just that it, it really is brought out very clearly here, and it may be because of the background of these false teachers who denied um, the Lord. But let's look at the other references real quick. So go to verse 8. For if these, I, I just want to show you my point. For if these qualities or these things are yours, and from, uh, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 11, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord, Jesus Christ, made clear to me. Verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 20. For if, they after, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, verse 2. That you should remember the predictions of the holy apostles and the commandment of the Lord and Savior. So the word Jesus isn't there, but Savior is, which makes it clear what the reference is. So it's not ambiguous. And then finally, the verse that's our text for today, but grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Growing surrender, growing submission. And yet, this profession, this emphasis on Jesus as being Lord stands out all the more in bold relief because of the backdrop, two things, backdrops, it is held up against. You know, if you want something to really stand out, so maybe you have a, a, something that's light in color, so you have a dark backdrop. You have something uh, dark in color, maybe you have a light backdrop. This is kind of the point that I'm using that word. What are these backdrops? Well, Remember, 2 Peter is roughly three years later than 1 Peter, and 1 Peter was already written in the context of, what, persecution. So there was an increase, this is Nero, there was increasing pressure on these Christians just to dip the colors a little bit. You could get yourself out of a whole lot of hot water if you were simply willing to do two things, say, Caesar is Lord, and do a pinch of incense. Many a Christian lost his life because he was unwilling to do that because the cry of Christians always against that backdrop was not Caesar, Jesus is Lord. In fact, I want to remind you of one that you've probably heard this story before, but this one is particularly poignant because it brings out this exact thought, this temptation. Just do that. What can it hurt? That small thing, what can it hurt? Well, Polycarp, who was the Bishop of Smyrna and was martyred by fire in AD, around AD 155. Why Polycarp is, is of interest to us in particular is because Polycarp knew the Apostle John. So he was a disciple of the Apostle John. And if you think about Smyrna, so he was there. And Smyrna was, the. if you think about the seven churches in the Revelation, Smyrna is the one that's known as the persecuted church. Look at it later if you don't have, if you don't remember it. And so the guy that we, maybe we would call something like today a, a chief of police, they go and they find Polycarp, they bring him back to where he's going to have to face the, face the music for this. And this is what this man says to him. Why? What harm is there in saying Caesar is Lord and offering incense? And of course, Polycarp refused. So finally, they got him to the stadium where the, these executions were going to take place. And the proconsul made a second attempt to get him to do that very same thing. And Polycarp refused. And these words have become very well known to us. Eighty-six years I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? That's the backdrop of Peter 
another backdrop is the fact that these false teachers were denying the lordship. So who knows? They not only needed to deny his lordship because they lived a lifestyle of license, and that's not Christian, but maybe they also needed to deny it to escape some of the fallout from professing Jesus as Lord, because I think really these people were originally professors. So where do we see that? Going back to ground we covered before, but uh, look at chapter 2, verse 1. But false apostles also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master. King James says Lord there, so that would be another occasion of Lord. And that would be unambiguous, but it's not the regular word for Lord. It's not kurios, it's despotes. And I pointed that out back when we were looking at the verse. So we're fine with that translation, master. But it refers to absolute authority. And that, that is all the more poignant, I think, when you get down to verse 10. And we find another thing about the characteristic of these false teachers when it says, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion. So that's one reason you have to throw off submission to Christ, because that's not the Christian way living according to the flesh and indulging the flesh. But also look, it says, and despise authority. And I think I pointed out to you at the time, that's actually the word lordship. So a very valid interpretation of that is it refers back to the Lord Jesus Christ and his lordship. This is all very interesting. So we have to hasten, though, as I say, <laughs> good thing you have your paper, um, this is another of the lessons that Jesus sought to inculcate into his disciples. You have it, John 13, 13. Look at that. You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. But Peter didn't always do so well with that, just like you and I haven't always done so well with that. And you find these little, these little vignettes, these little things he says that just sort of betray that way of thinking. And we do it all the time. But he says this. When, when, in that same context, really, in, earlier in the evening when and Jesus is trying to make this point to him, you know, you just said something that's inconsistent with that. But he said, I'm going to wash your feet. And Jesus, uh, Peter said, oh, no, no, no. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus stopped him in his tracks on that one and said, if I don't wash you, you don't share with me. That stopped him in his tracks. Here's another one. That story in Luke 5 where he said, Get back in the boats, go out there, let down your nets for a draft. Peter had something to say about that, and he was a fisherman, right? Master, we've toiled all night. And look, you're the son of a carpenter, and yes, you're our, you're our master, you're our teacher, but we know fishing. Now, I mean, I don't know much, but I do know fishing. <laughs> And yeah, I just said, this is how we are. Master, we toiled all night. You can almost see a sanctified or an unsanctified eye roll. But if you say so, at your word, I will let down the nets. Well, it's no wonder he's then, when he caught that great big catch that he said to him, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Well, we have to keep moving, so let's look at our last one. And growing confidence. I like this one. I, I think, to me, of all of them, uh, death and martyrdom. Did, did Peter really know that was in the plan? He did. You remember John 21, when Jesus spelled that out for him? I mean, I should read the verse. I didn't have a slide for it, but... That's why I tell you, I do all this stuff earlier in the week and have it all done, and then I get up on Sunday morning, and, <laughs> you know, I, but it's too late to add to it then. That's all right, it would be too long if we did that. But look at John chapter 21, verse 18. Truly Jesus says to him, I say unto you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, or get ready, you might say, and walk wherever you wanted. You get up, get ready, go. What do you wanted to do? But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will get you ready, dress you, and carry you where you do not want to go. So he knew this. And he tells us quite plainly in verse 12 of chapter 1, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, although you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Verse 13, I think it right 
as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will soon be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. But, you know, in those verses, and I didn't have time when I was there, you almost have like a little mini theology of death for the believer. And you know what? Everybody in here is getting older. So if Jesus tarries, I mean, I don't like to dwell on it, don't like to think about it too much, but you have to think about it enough to be ready and to do those things that are appropriate to do. And the, the, the real acid test question is, do we have assurance about that? I mean, we ask that question all the time, right? I mean, if you walked out of this building and fell dead, you have assurance that you'd be with Jesus? Can you have that assurance? You know, some people tell you you can't know. That's a lie from hell. You can know. And where we see this little mini theology is, look at, like Paul, he sees the body as a tent. You don't see it because ESV translates it twice, body. Verse 13, verse 14, I am in this body, he says. But he uses the word tent. And I think I did take time to point that out to you when we were here that you know, a tent's not something you live in permanently, at least you sure hope not. A tent's a temporary type thing, and that's how you kind of, as you grow in grace, that's kind of how you regard life. You realize, you know, this world really isn't our home. As the little chorus goes, we're just passing through, and we're not going to be here forever. And People spend all this money. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, do what you can to keep yourself healthy. I'm all for that. But some people think they can keep themselves beautiful forever and spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on that. Hmm, I don't know. You know, you can do something, and, you know, it's always good to do what you can do within your means, but we're not going to be here forever. Paul said that. You know, I have the Second Corinthians 1 for you. I thought I did. Yes, I didn't. But, uh, oh, yes, I do, right there. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building. So in other words, death is like striking a tent. And if you, if you read back, like, like in the 19th century, if you, especially if you like read uh, stuff about the war between the states, that was a common expression in those days, a strike tent. You just take the tent down because we're moving. That fits very nicely with what he says next. Like Paul, he sees death as a departure. Where do we see that? Well, in verse 15. Look at this. He says, And I will make every effort so that after my departure. But it's the word exodus. And I, I did point that out at the time. In Greek, exodus. And we actually have that word coming over into English. Hados in Greek is a road or a way. You put X or ek on the front of it, and it's a road out. It's a way out. It's the exit. So if you want to leave the auditorium, you have a lot of choices. You look for the exit. You look for the exodus. It's the way out. And, of course, this has deep biblical imagery because we think of the exodus and the children of Israel. God brought them out of that place in an exodus, and he made them his people in virtue of redemption and the Passover lamb, and he brought them into the promised land. So they weren't just going out arbitrarily, they were going out because they were going to somewhere. Same thing for you and me. Look up in verse where he uses the exact opposite word in the original. He says, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance. And he uses the word isodos. Not exodos, but isodos, which is the way into. So when you think about death, you don't think about just something arbitrary in the end of the road. You think about, well, if Jesus tarries, it's the way out of this world. But I'm going to walk out of this world, and where am I going to be? I'm going to walk into the next. You know that song, sometimes people would request it at funerals, Stepping on Shore? How many people know that song? Yeah, that thing kind of starts dreary, doesn't it? But, but you know, it kind of gets going, and you can see why people enjoy that. That's what it is, beloved. That's what it is. Now, Paul uses a slightly different word, and we have to close with this. He uses, he says the same thing. 
I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering in the time of my departure. Hey, but he uses a different word, but it has the same similar energy, imagery because it's this word analusis, which means it's used in context where you would be departing on ship. And, and what would you do if you were departing on ship? You'd cast off the moorings and you'd leave port. But you don't leave port just to go out there and go in circles. You leave port because you're going somewhere. He uses the same word. And this is one of Jesus' most precious lessons. You know, you think about this in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the way. And Paul, of course, talks about this confidence. We're out of time, so we are always confident, as the King James says, or of good courage. The next verse, 8, says, yes, we are of good courage, we're confident. Why? Because we're confident that being at home in the body, we're away from home from the Lord, and if we should be away from home from the body, we will be at home with the Lord. Where does all this take us? Well, it, it, here's the closing thought. The Peter of Second Peter has come a long way from the Peter of the Gospels. That's the point. And the Secondary thought is, the verse says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge. And I'm going to tell you folks, you know this, but the grace and knowledge, those two things of Jesus Christ, they're transformative. They will transform you. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us these weeks and lessons together. I pray that you'll bless now all that will happen in this day to our hearts for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.